Good. So as Caitlin pointed out, it's my first time here um, in the IPFS community. But uh, for the story, so I am um, I got a PhD in AI machine learning now um, quite some years back. And uh, I first started working with IPFS actually in 2018 with a colleague of mine. You know, the, the whole blockchain topic was getting a bit more um, a bit more traction in the research world as well. And uh, being a contributor to the Apache Kafka, I was working on a, on a Kafka research paper and we, I was collaborating with a colleague actually to work on IPFS um, research paper. And as things sometimes happen, we got into, into arguments leading to being, you know, removed from those mutual papers. I was quite happy because my Kafka paper got a lot of traction in the in a research world. However, after so many years, actually his IPFS paper is the most cited of the full group. So uh, that was kind of, I, I missed out on something there. Um, yeah, I'm very happy that uh, the talk has been, is hosted in the Luxembourg Amsterdam uh, room because I'm based in Luxembourg and I also like Amsterdam for other reasons. But let's get started here. So what I have put, pardon, what I've put here in this slide is I would say, uh, an overall consensus, I would say, in pop culture of uh, what future uh, holds for us. Basically, um, dirty, everything is dirty, everything is overcrowded. And I don't know if you, you saw, so I tried with the AI to make a picture to have some sort of like a futuristic uh, Sauron Tower in the back, but uh, that should illustrate the big corporation that is, uh, you know, having an eye on everybody and, um, you know, kind of imposing its will. And um, I think we can we can all agree in this room that what we are rather looking at, and I think we could all live with, is to have some futuristic society where technology, architecture, and everything, um, you know, coexists well, is integrated in nature, and we have a good environment, a healthy environment, but we still, um, you know, um, can have a, a comfortable life thanks, for, for, thanks to technology. Um, so at Fileger, we think that uh, a whole lot of that has to do with data, um, because uh, currently in the current um, in the current society, we think a lot of individuals or society in general can only participate in uh, transparency uh, post facts. So in other terms, mm -hmm. there is going to be a certain scandal, and then everything will be you know laid out in uh, in the media, and um, everybody can only see what's happening there, where basically it's going to be lawyers deciding on, on what's going to happen. So why not having a, a system or having tools to let everybody participate in transparency, but prior to scandals, you know, so that scandals shouldn't happen at all. So um, we want to take the approach that we create digital twins um, and to those digital twins, we, we use them as sort of a shell that will contain a lot of different data that we attach to it. So basically life cycling. Now, what is a digital twin? When, when I enter a, a Google search, a digital twin will mostly show me pictures of uh, 3D buildings, um, but generally the term digital twin makes the assumption um, it is a 3D representation of something that exists in the real world. But I would say um, in that logic, that would be my digital twin. I think we, we, we all agree, right? But in, in real life, I am more than that. So I'm also all the history I have, all my medical history, so to say, so all this is written down in my lifetime. So this is also part of me, so it should be part of my digital twin. And likewise, for example, everything that all my financial statement, taxes, uh, uh, spending, or, you know, um, what, what I do financially should also be part of it. So the digital twin, the way we see it is for sure one way there is, a, it can be a 3D representation, but what we believe is more so important is to have a very clear and trustworthy, um, data, uh, traceability that is defining, uh, an object, an individual, or even some, some digital assets for that matter. So in that, 
in, in that sense, we can say, we can probably argue that everybody is uh, has big data or is generating uh, lots and lots of data. Every transaction that we do, every agreement um, that we that we make. All of that is a data point that that uh, can be relevant for digital twin. If we look at sensors, indoor navigation, outdoor navigation, uh, water quality or air quality in in parking garages, all of that uh, are data points that are relevant. Everything that we have in paperwork so far, um, every mail that we get, right. Um, if it's lost, it's lost, but it, it could be documented. Work operations. So here I gave an example of um, of uh, two pe persons, you know, completing a paint job. What about you now? You want to repaint your house in exactly the same color? Can you remember ten years from there what color that was? Uh, what exact uh, mix that was made to 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 do it? And we say what we, we cannot improve on the things we cannot measure. So it's very, very important that we really capture those data points, but that we can also um, be assured that those data points, they are trustworthy and authentic. So um, that's where what we try to bring to the table. We say, um, it, we say that uh, data is just laying around. And I will show you uh, in, a, in, in a few slides, you know, how complex it can become to actually acquire this data in the field. But once it has been acquired and has been stored somewhere, you have to make it available easily so that you can actually extract value from the data. We have built a, a data hub for IoT. Um, we provide or we try to provide, we're still working heavily on this, on, uh, on a smart data capture, but first and foremost, bridging the gap between the digital and the physical world so that those information from the physical world get put in um, in a good uh, in a good shape in a good uh, results in a good data set so so one example you can think of is everything that has to do with air quality I think people have become very sensitive to this topic uh, during the, the COVID crisis where everybody just opened the windows uh, properly so to get fresh air in but it turned out that this was actually since a long time something that should have been done because there has been a lot of research that showed um, uh, how air quality can, you know, uh, improve your brain performance uh, and those type of things. So here, that's one example where you can work very well with sensors um, to see what um, what the air quality is, what the CO2 content in your room uh, data is, and it becomes uh, very important. Um, it can even be a, a compliance case when we think of certain cases, such as in elderly care, or in, in, in child care to prove that you always have very good environmental conditions um, for the persons in your care to be uh, to be healthy, but especially in parking garages where you have to take care that you know you don't have a too high of a concentration of uh, gases, exhaust gases. Um, so this this is one part, let's say, of this data acquisition pipeline related to IoT. But obviously, here comes the the second part that documents are even even important, uh, are equally important, and they also need to be captured. Um, but I mean, this this is quite simple through those interfaces. Um, but we would argue that to be to really be performant, we need to create much more touch points. Um, throughout the life cycle of objects, if it is food or, uh, or a car or a piece of, of, of clothing, uh, you know, in the, in the supply chain, we have to create more touch points. When we think of food, this is another great example. You know, in the Luxembourg area, we do produce quite a lot of wine. So this is also, uh, you know, now starting to get some more traction to understand in what shape are you, your wine yards to produce good quality wine, um, detect, um, detect uh, diseases. And what's, what's very important once this data is captured, what I have mentioned is really to have for all sorts of um, 
data points require to make them easily available. So they need to be interoperable. So from one platform that we see here, which is our digital twin platform, it should be easily uh, translatable um, to this um, uh, other data storage, which which is simply uh, Elasticsearch. So, um, you know, also give the people the means to consume the data the way they like it best. Hmm? So this is, I would say, more industrial scale data capture. But if we now take a look on, on what is happening in the field. So I spoke about smart data capture. If you now, if now a construction worker or a supply chain worker, I don't know, working on, on cleaning coffee beans or um, working on some uh, food production. So they are all working in the field. And so now how are they going to capture that data? Um, so we tried to in, in several experiments already, we tried to uh, to add more touch points to this actually um, through a mobile phone. Actually, your mobile phone is equipped or can be equipped with a, a lot of different sensors. Now, imagine uh, in a in a very simple use case, you have a construction worker sending you a bill documenting its work processes via uh, via sensors, for example, uh, badging in, badging out but also via certain via certain tags. NFC, for example, um, can allow you to quickly upload the data and you need you have it right where you need it. What we know right now is you get handed a sheet of paper that is some sort of a report and you must have the discipline to sit on your desk um, and uh, scan it, what most of the people just don't do and that's why we, we lose this kind of information. I'm just skipping this one. Um, and just to, to illustrate, you know, how, um, how smart, uh, or how helpful a smartphone can be. Those have been, uh, use cases that we, that we have documented now in a food or in, um, in the medicine supply chain. So with the data capture app, we try to propose an interface that allows you to scan, to, um, to attach certain sensors. So in the first image, we illustrate what everybody knows, the PDF scanner. But the second one now is a bit more interesting. It is, um, it is a, a heat camera that can be immediately plugged into a mobile device. And it allows you, for example, to document in what shape a cooling truck was or in what conditions um, the, um, the, the frozen or, you know, the, the cool down uh, products have been right with your mobile phone. Um, another example in this is, for example, what you now see a lot in into the, the pharmaceuticals um, or in, in the food transport is you see the, the well, from your... The right side, the right side, um, sensor. Those are small data loggers that you simply can put into, um, into a shipment. And during the shipment, it will track for you the temperature and the humidity in the air. So for example, to, to make sure that your, your vegetables or your food doesn't start to, to rot or to, to be transported in bad, uh, conditions. And here again, this is very easily, uh, capturable with a mobile phone so that it was actually designed for that way and we see again here we have a perfect gateway to uh, capture this data in the field and uh, to upload it somewhere uh, where people can use it one big issue with those um, with those sensors um, are that they are many times out of a closed environment um, so you either equip everything from uh, from one provider and then you're basically locked in the whole environment and that's kind of difficult if you think of supply chains that function across countries um um to to have those so we have been very strong in in trying out um in trying out you know um open source sensors from uh, open source platforms so you see those shells they are uh, 3d printed but uh, all the sensors you that have been um, you know put in there they are open source so we see on the on the one hand side like a low resolution heat camera that uh, well granted doesn't give you a lot of details but um at least allows you to see if there are some big uh, deviation from what should be normal 
you can see a, a soil measurement sensor that you can that you can put out there to uh, that we use for example for the vineyards to see um, if the the soil is in good condition or you know um, some some air sensors or some movement sensors so uh, all of this exists in the open source world but even there we still have to find uh, an agreement on uh, what should be the the real exchange format to um, to really exchange the data points, but also to understand, for example, each sensors they have some uh, measurement inaccuracies. There is a certain range of inaccuracies, so that that also must be communicated when a measurement of a sensor um, has been made. So once all of this is is completed, um, it is pretty simple, you know, with this smart data capture or with your mobile phone to really um, um, upload the data points from every single, um, um, you know, point in the in the supply chain. Uh, um, without without really needing you to go to your desk or or things like this. So we we try to illustrate you that's a, a challenge that we have um, that we have won now in uh, 2020. That's some time ago, but you see kind of now how long we um, we we work on this for now. So I try to to show you the video. Um, but basically, what's happened is we we bootstrap our app with uh with uh, certain details and here what we try to represent is um adding data receivers so you need to scan um you need to scan a qr code so here i mentioned i'm i'm based in luxembourg so let's say uh the Luxem luxembourg government can receive data sent from our platform we make a key exchange and we can all of a sudden also um, you know, add other data receivers that are that are persons by scanning the, um, the other QR code from from a participant, and we can from there on start um, sending data to um, to each other and include all the important parties. So here we represent the case of a lease agreement. So with the application, we are now scanning. Well, it's the, the, the student ID of the colleague working working with us at the time, and um, we, we just scan this part. But what now happens is that uh, those data points they have been um, shared with the authority, but also with myself. And like we say, one block later, um, we see in our data vault everything that has been shared with us. We see, okay, um, new incoming data has come in here, and it's notarized with a blockchain transaction. Another case where you need to capture data in the field is, for example, um, an inspection. So let's say you are renting an apartment, you try to inspect um, all the issues that you can find, and you're just taking pictures very easily. And again, um, in a handover, um, in a handover file, we see everything that was captured there. Well, we show some Ethereum transactions, but I think that's not very spectacular. When when the audience is let, less blockchain, um, you know, or less pros in blockchain, it, it makes some more effects. Good. So from the from the technology point of view. Um, we have uh, partnerships with several uh, sensor providers, even going um, as deep as um, placing certain cryptographic keys on uh, crypto crypto chips in the sensors. That we can even be sure that the measure that the measurement that was um, sent to us is indeed coming from the, the the sensor that was that we think was placed in the in the field. Um, we provide SDKs for ma major platforms between Android, iOS, um, but also a, a TypeScript SDK. Um, the application can be cloud native, so we offer you uh, gateways um, on most of the, the cloud providers. So for now, AWS Cloud and GCP, Azure is in the in the working. So if you're on either on those clouds, there is no there will be no issue to to just run this application as well on your known environment. Um, I would say uh, the the successes that we can uh, talk about is uh, we collected over 300k uh, grant money so far so gravimental and uh, ecosystem grant from uh, from XRPL 
Um, from, from the customers, we have right now five urban farms that we are going to onboard. I'll show you some nice pictures now in a bit. It's a very nice project. And uh, two biochar factories. One is in the making. It's going to be a, a, a well. It's called a biochar mega factory. So it's supposed to be the largest one in the world in uh, in in China. Uh, we have closed our family and friends round just now, and uh, we have cre cre recently um, signed an agreement with the, the Echo Channel. So it's, uh, I think, the first sustainability uh, TV channel with uh, over five. Uh, uh, Amir is saying 8 million. Oh, apologies. Well, you know, 5 is just above the 8, so it must have been uh, an issue with me uh, uh, typing in this number. Um, so to summarize, um, to summarize what we have, what we have done is when, when, uh, NFTs came out, so it was sort of limited to art on blockchain, but it is like the ideal vessel to, to represent a digital twin. Um, so the NFT, think of an NFT being, um, being the on-chain representation of an individual, uh, a product or, or anything. Um, that you can imagine and you know um, from there we can always upload it with uh, authentic and trustworthy data so to you know to to give you now a little bit of insights what what we are doing so about of those five urban farms this is now uh, the urban farm that is um, that is around uh, Strasbourg I think um, so now we are going to start basically to put uh, sensors all over this those fields um, this is the, the, the rooftop farm, um, that is based in Luxembourg, uh, from the same provider. And, um, and here basically you see, uh, microgreens or you see, uh, other kind of cultures. Um, I didn't take a picture here from the hydroponics, but here again, the idea is really to equip the soil, the, the water with sensors so that on your end product, they're actually also bu brewing beer with microgreens. So think of your beer bottle having a QR code and you will be able to understand in what uh, soil conditions or in what overall conditions those uh, ingredients have been um, have been um, you know uh, grown and, and harvested um, coming to the the biochar factory so this is like the the prototype factory of one of our colleagues uh, visiting it this is the end product that comes out I, I show you some better pictures um, of this but I, I liked the their branding, I basically love it, and um, that's why I put in this picture. Um, but in in Paralysis, what's happening is you you bring basically wood waste, um, and this wood waste um, is put in this uh, Paralysis engine, and uh, this is the different processes. And um, in the end, you will receive um, biochar, and this can be recycled into other type of projects. So here you see like a small uh, plastic element. And uh, our partners, you see, they are building all types of casings out of this biochar. And those cases now contain 20% um, less plastic because um, this is, you know, now uh, covered by... Um, by biochar and, and where we come in here is we are documenting what is getting into um, the, the pyrolysis uh, engine and what is coming out what uh, products have been created out of this uh, this biochar and you know obviously mark um, you know now this this leads to co2 credits again um so that's what we're working on i think this little video also it's a very short one uh shows the uh, too bad. So it, it was um, it was a small video to show you this process uh, in a bit more uh, appealing way, but it seems not to not to play. I'm very sorry about this. So with this, I'm at the end of my presentation. Um, I hope you 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 got some some information about data acquisition in the field and how complex it is. And I'm happy to take questions.